Hello and welcome. My name is Astrid Edwards and I am the host of Between the Lines for the City of Melbourne uh, series talking to the most wondrous writers in Victoria. Today I am speaking to Louisa Lim and before we begin I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I live and work. I am currently not in Melbourne. I am about an hour north <clears throat> on Jaja Warung land uh, and I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land here and note that sovereignty was never ceded. The Melbourne City of Literature itself uh, is located on the lands of the um, uh, the <clears throat> sorry excuse me um, is located on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and Louisa, where are you this morning? I'm joining you from uh, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. You're much closer to Melbourne than I am. Welcome. Louisa, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit by sharing your bio. Um, firstly, congratulations once again on your latest work, which came out in 2022, Indelible City. Uh, but you have written um, so many things. You are an award-winning journalist, a podcaster, and an author. <clears throat> Indelible City is your second book. Uh, it has uh, attracted lots of awards and shortlistings, and I won't list them all, but that does include for our international audience um, being shortlisted for the Stella Prize, which is a national prize in Australia for women and non-binary writers. Um, it includes being listed for the Victorian Premier's Literary Awards and also the Walkley Book Award, which is a journalism award. Um, your previous book, The People's Republic of Amnesia, Tiananmen Revisited, came out in 2014, and it was listed for the Orwell Prize for Political Writing. And uh, by day, when you are not writing books, you are a senior lecturer in journalism at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and before moving into academia, you were a correspondent for the BBC and for NPR uh, in China. Uh, and you are published um, all over the world, uh, including in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian. Uh, so welcome. It is a pleasure to be talking to you today. Oh, it's such a pleasure to talk to you as well, Astrid. Louisa, this is a remarkable book and a remarkable achievement, both in terms of the words on the page, but also the moment in time that you capture and how you weave uh, your personal experience into a much greater and grander narrative. Can you introduce Indelible City to those watching? So Indelible City is really, um, it's a love letter to the city that I grew up in. Um, it's a part memoir, it's part um, partly investigative and then partly journalistic as well because I happened to be there in 2019 when um, the huge protests just took over the whole city of Hong Kong. And so I sort of, you know, I guess I didn't know it when I was writing it, but I was charting the moment at which the city unraveled but I also went back in time to look at Hong Kong's histories and um, the different ways in which Hong Kong's history has been told uh, and how you know how do you build an identity when your history is so complicated so it, it is a complicated book it's about cities and histories and identity it is a complicated work, but it also it is also a very literary work. I mean, not just because it was, you know, um, shortlisted for prizes, but this is not a traditional nonfiction book with, you know, a beginning, middle and end um, with a little bit of your own experience. This is, um, I think, a profound reflection, if I can say that, Louisa, on your personal experience and your um, uh thinking through what it means to be a journalist at a moment in time and what journalism can do and what journalism can't do and what you can do as a journalist. And it was also this wondrous exploration of the King of Kowloon, which I believe, if I remember correctly, is kind of where you started, but of course the, the work grew. We are going to talk about the King of Kowloon today. Can you introduce him to us? So the King of Kowloon was this um, quite famous, iconic figure in Hong Kong. I guess I'll just um, share a picture of him because I think um, it, it really sum, sums him up. So he was a, he was a trash sorter, uh, but he also believed that the peninsula of Kowloon had been stolen from his family when it was ceded to the British in the 1860s. 
and that um, he was the king of Kowloon. And he spent half a century going across the city, just writing in this quite terrible calligraphy all over the city, his claims over the land. So he wrote on um, lampposts and post boxes and electricity boxes and flyovers. It was very interesting. He was very contextual about his writing. He only wrote in places that were owned by uh, originally crown land, but then the government. So he only wrote on state land. He didn't write on private property. And he would write his family tree, sort of 20 generations of his family, all the names and the places that they had owned. And, and this is the, uh, the picture at the back of my book, which I love. It's him uh, in his house. And as you can see from that picture, his writing is so distinctive. It's not um, beautiful in the way that Chinese calligraphy is supposed to be. You know, Chinese calligraphy is supposed to be really balanced. And you're supposed to use certain styles and you learn to imitate those styles perfectly. And then the balance of your characters, the beauty uh, that reflects your learning and your um, wisdom and his characters, you know, he went to school for two years. His characters were really sort of crooked and misshapen and ugly. And, you know, the thing that made people think he was crazy was that a, he claimed to be the king of Kowloon, but B, he wasn't ashamed of his terrible handwriting. In fact, it sort of it was his calling card. And you know, he he wrote all over the city, and every time he wrote somewhere, these government cleaners they came and they washed it away or they painted over it. But over time, it, his status changed. And um, in 1997, an uh, art curator called Lao Kin Wai gave him an exhibition just before Hong Kong's sovereignty returned. To China and uh, he nothing sold and it was just a sort of scandal uh, the art world was up in arms but that was the beginning of a change in his status and he became an artist although he never thought he was an artist but his work sold um, at Sotheby's he was the first Hong Kong artist to represent Hong Kong at the uh, Venice Biennale um, you know his work was selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars and he became the most valuable artist in Hong Kong and then this sort of icon where you know his work was printed on bed sheets and underwear and sold everywhere and you could get commemorative whiskey bottles he was in films doing uh these uh, uh cameo appearances and you know poets wrote poems to him so, you know so, these singers wrote songs to him so he just became this figure and I remembered him from my childhood and I just got quite obsessed by him. He is a remarkable personality throughout the book and, you know, his presence in the book and your, um, your, your search for him at, at kind of really brings out other themes of, you know, what has happened to um, Hong Kong, the history of Hong Kong, who has laid claim to that piece of land and why over hundreds and indeed um, thousands of years when you go back into the history. I want to talk to you all about this, Louisa, but I feel as we talk in 2023, after you published this book in 2022 and the protests began in Hong Kong in 2019, I don't feel we can kind of go further and, and, and talk together for you know the next hour without noting how Hong Kong is going now um, and what has happened to your books uh, recently um, in China. Would you kind of place us in the 2023 context? So um, in 2020, uh, this very draconian national security legislation was imposed on Hong Kong and it was imposed sight unseen. Not even the chief executive of Hong Kong at the time had seen it, but it was imposed from China. And this legislation, it outlaws um, some subversion, uh, collusion with foreign powers, terrorism, um, and sedition. Um, and it has been used very wi widely because the definitions are very, very vague. And so there's been this sort of huge crackdown after the protests where um, 
na national security has really become the central focus of public life. You know, school curriculum have been written, rewritten to um, reflect national security. And the legislature has been remade, the court system has changed. So the national security law really trumps all other laws. And as a part of those changes, um, cultural life has changed massively. And just recently, they um, uh, they removed a whole lot of books from public libraries because of <clears throat> uh, uh, <clears throat> these me were many books that were about uh, political issues. Uh, um, some estimates as much as as many as forty percent of books about local politics. So books by academics and um, intellectuals and politicians. And among those books that were removed was my first book, which is about Tiananmen. Um, I should say this book, Indelible City, has never really been in public libraries in Hong Kong. Um, one of the reasons is the, the words, these words on, on the cover, Hong Kong Yang Gayao, is one of the protest slogans from 2019, which means, it literally means add oil, Hong Kongers, or sort of go, hooray. It's just like a cheer of encouragement. Um, but in a court case um, about the national security law, the court heard that these words could be potentially subversive. And so because they're on the cover of my book, it has not really been stocked in sort of major bookstores and public libraries in Hong Kong. And, you know, following these changes, I don't, you know, it's clear that it it won't be. So it, it there's been this, this sort of gi gigantic, uh, it's, it's like a slow rolling purge of Hong Kong life um, where the institutions have really been transformed one by one. And a lot of um, civil society has, just disappeared you know these sort of independent trade unions and NGOs that had really been at the backbone of Hong Kong life they have disbanded themselves for fear that um that the na national security law you know that they may have fallen foul of the national security law which is being applied retroactively in some cases and newspapers as well as many as 12 newspapers have shut down so it's it is a city transformed and you know I didn't know when I was writing and doing all that research uh, for my book that that it would be that way it would be a love letter for a city that has really changed forever. Hong Kong is many things and it has been a global city. Uh, we've had a pandemic obviously that changed many things and I've been reflecting, you know, coming back to Indelible City, how much went unnoticed by the rest of the world during the pandemic, um, you know, to kind of get us to this point with your journalistic hat on? Um, I think the it was, the pandemic did make it harder for people to notice what was going on in Hong Kong because everybody was, you know, obsessed with what was going on where they lived. But I think it was also used by um, the Hong Kong government. Uh, you know, they used this zero COVID policy um, and had long, long, um, you know, if you flew in or out, you had to stay in isolation and quarantine for three weeks. So I think those kind of policies really had the impact of blunting Hong Kong's um, position as an international trade center because all the multinationals um, eventually, you know, were moving their executives out of Hong Kong. Um, so I think it was um, maybe used opportunistically by the Hong Kong government to push through a lot of changes and to do them very, very fast. One of the in my opinion, one of the most beautiful things about your book, Indelible City, is how you continually question what your role is, what your position is, as things are happening around you and in the world. And there is this 
moment that I now make all my um, students think about, Louisa, uh, even though I'm not allowed to uh, set them any text to study, um, uh, which is at the beginning of Indelible City, where you are covering a protest, you are a journalist, you are there and, you know, witnessing and recording, and you pick up a brush and help to paint a sign, a protest sign. Can you talk through, I mean, obviously that personal moment, but also how that moment and your decision to include it in the book really changed the story you decided to share with us all? Yeah, I'm, I was, you know, to begin with, I was a bit reluctant to use that moment and to tell anyone about it because I knew that I was violating that sort of cardinal tenet of journalism, that you're supposed to be a spectator you know, that you're supposed to be neutral, that you're supposed to be objective and not part of whatever is happening. Um, so what had happened that day was uh, throughout the course of Hong Kong's protests, going back to 2014, the umbrella movement, um, there had been this really mysterious sort of collective of sign painters and um, they would, write these gigantic signs sort of you know the size of a 10-story building hundreds of meters long uh maybe hundreds of meters my maths isn't that good <laughs> now I'm worried that, that but anyway like 9 10 8 10 stories that that kind of height and you would wake up in the morning and you would see these signs sort of thrown over the mountaintops signs the first one was calling for democracy for universal suffrage but over the years, there were many signs and they were um, things like, um, you know, with this, with the anti -extrad the extradition law in 2019, they were calling for the removal of that. And I never know, knew who these people were. I had no idea who these sign painters were. Um, I had no way of getting in touch with them, but I was always obsessed by sort of the power of signs and graffiti and language. And over time, I had gone and tried to track down all the people who knew the King of Kowloon. And it turns out that the people who knew the King of Kowloon were really interestingly, they were all the sort of the political figures, the activists, artists, scholars, journalists, but there were people who were thinking a lot about these issues already, about issues of sort of dispossession and sovereignty. And so they were sort of very political class of people. And they later turned out to be the people who were really important in the 2019 movement. So I always felt that my search for the king had sort of bread, breadcrumbed my trail in reporting 2019 and the protests, because once those broke out, I kind of knew everybody because I'd been to interview them about the King of Kowloon. And anyway, um, that day, when I met the sign painters, it was the day before China's National Day. So it was, um, which is October the 1st, 2019. So it was the very end of September. And I just got this random message from someone, a, a source who said, oh, um, there are these sign painters who are making these big signs that are uh, appearing on the mountains. Would you like to meet them? <laughs> it's like, Yes, of course I'd like to meet them, of course. So uh, we made a meeting time and they took me to their place where they worked. And it was super interesting because the only place large enough to dry and to write and dry these sort of gigantic signs is on the top of a building, on the top of a skyscraper, because of course in Hong Kong buildings and houses are so tiny that you couldn't possibly write a, a 10 story sign on top of them and you can't do it outside because you know the signs were political potentially subversive and so we went up to the rooftop of a skyscraper and i met uh the sign painters and they were not who i thought they would be i thought they would be uh, very young and very athletic and um they weren't they were much older and um we talked and, uh, you know, then they started unrolling their canvas and um, I watched as they uh, 
um, sketched out the letters that they were going to to write, and then um, I watched uh, as they as they filled them in, as they began sort of painting them in, and it was um, a really uh, <laughs> it was a really uh, sweary sort of funny uh, slogan that 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 they were writing that day. Um, it was this uh, slogan, which um, was, it, it's really, really hard to translate, but it was um, uh, sort of, um, in, in Cantonese, it's very funny. Uh, it was, um, and anyway, as I was watching them, I just, I kind of had, this feeling where I knew that I was going to join in and I knew that as as a journalist I probably shouldn't but as a writer and someone who was had been thinking about the power of words for so long and who'd been thinking about by the at this point I've already been in um like researching the king of Kowloon for five years and I just wanted to feel what it felt like to write a sign that would you know make a difference and um so I did, I picked up a paint pot and I joined in and I just, at that point, you know, I knew it was perceived as wrong as a journalist, but at the same time, I thought, you know, when in this particular case, I was both a journalist and a Hong Konger and my responsibilities to be one shouldn't cancel out my responsibilities to be another. So it did make me redefine my role and redefine what I thought, how I thought a journalist should behave. You teach journalism. You have lots of students. Um, I'm interested in kind of how you discuss, like um, maybe how you've changed um, with your students, but I'm also interested in how the university um, uh considers the fact that one of your books has been disappeared. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know, how, how does an Australian university place that? I don't know if they know or care. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Well, that's <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure whether they, it's on their radar. Mm. I mean, in terms of discussing the way that I behave, actually, I still have not had yet a student who's asked me about it. Um, I don't know if that's because they don't read uh, my book, <laughs> but um, if I was to discuss it, I would, you know, I would talk, and I guess I do talk about it in one class. I, I talk about it in terms of ethical journalism. You know, I think we really have seen this, this move whereby it's really acknowledged that reporting, um, you know, this sort of cat, parachute journalism just sort of popping in and popping out of a place doesn't really equip you to tell the whole story and that you really need people who are part of a community you know who've grown up there embedded in this community who are able to tell that story properly and I think part of you know the idea of ethical journalism is that it, it is not always correct to report one side and then the other side of every single story that the you know when the preponderance of the facts lies very heavily one way that then you know that is how you kind of weight your reporting so I guess the way that I sometimes think about it is if you were reporting writing Ukraine stories um, if you quoted a Russian spokesman in every single Ukraine story, or if you went to Russian sources to balance out what was happening, it would be a very different view than if you were reporting from Ukraine um, on, on the ground. Uh, and so, you know, I think that idea of ethical journalism is, it does inform, you know, particularly in the US, how African-American communities are reported on and here in Australia, I think we need to do more of it in reporting on Indigenous Australians. Um, so I think it has shifted my view 
I, I guess the other thing that I tell my students is that um, transparency is is important now. And, and you know, if you are kind of part of the story, sort of locating yourself as part of that story and making that really obvious. And I, I did try and do that right from the start because, um, you know, my own position is also quite complicated. You know, I call myself a Hong Konger, but I'm not a native Hong Konger. I wasn't born there, neither of my parents. Um, from Hong Kong, and I, you know, I barely speak Cantonese. I speak very poor Cantonese, which is the main language. But at the same time, you know, my parents moved there when I was five, so I've lived large portions of my life there. I reported it's handover, and I also have one. Um, uh, my mother's English and my father's Chinese, and my family has had a sort of long, um, a very long kind of uh, relationship with Hong Kong over the generations. So I sort of come from a particular background. And I I thought, you know, to begin with, when I was writing the book, I did think I'll write a, a very journalistic book where I was hardly present and it would be, you know, a reportage. But it just became very obvious in the writing that that wasn't possible for me that you know my life and my family's life was too intertwined in Hong Kong to do that and every time I wrote something personal my editor just loved it and so she kept pushing me <laughs> to go more and more personal and so yeah over the writing over the course of the writing it did change. The editors always love the personal. I'm interested now you know the book's been out 10 months ish um I think uh, as we're talking um you must have received a lot of feedback obviously you know um uh kind of you know um, attracting a lot of attention in the prizes but also from from readers from from readers in Australia from readers in um around the world you have also um you know I was listening to NPR a few weeks ago and and suddenly you were in my um you, you were on the <laughs> podcast there um which was a pleasant surprise you know you are still actively um being asked about um this as a journalist but also because of this book I'm I guess my question is how are you navigating everything now you put a lot of yourself in this book but it is also journalism and um events continue in Hong Kong how has the response been yeah that, that's my question Louisa. um no the response has been really it's been really interesting um as in the case of my last book, I always worry when the books come out, whether there's going to be some kind of denunciation from, from Beijing or something. But in each case, I've been really careful in that I've used a lot of historical source material, which is incontrovertible. So the People's Republic of Amnesia, I used Chinese state propaganda uh, in order to show that there was uh, a massacre outside Beijing in Chengdu that the, the government admitted at that time. And so, you know, when you're using material like that, it becomes quite hard to deny things. Um, and in this case, I used a lot of um, historical archives, which painted the British in a very poor light indeed, um, when it came to the, the negotiations over Hong Kong's return. Um, so, you know, I didn't, have any kind of that kind of denunciation um i've had uh, a lot of response from hong kong chinese and hong kongers around the world uh, often you know i've had a lot of messages um, and emails from people who were so moved by the book and who um you know talked about what it meant to them and often it's people like me who have somewhat complicated backgrounds, you know, one Hong Kong parent or lived in Hong Kong for decades and moved away, or even people, um, there was one woman who came to a talk in, in Sydney who said that she was a Hong Konger, although she'd never been to Hong Kong in her life because her parents were Hong Kongers. And so often, or Hong Kongers in exile as well. Um, those kind of people, I think they find that the book really um, resonates 
with them and with their own experience and particularly people who are like me Eurasian um there's not a lot written but and then there were these moments which are really extraordinary and um I was speaking at a literary festival in Auckland and um it was in the uh, Aotea Centre and they have this Kiwi, Dame Kiwi to Kanawa Hall, which is gigantic, just terrifyingly huge. And, you know, the moderator, Sam Sashideva and I, we were terrified that we wouldn't wouldn't be able to you know, fit enough people, you know, there wouldn't be any people, it would all be empty. Uh, but actually, lots of people turned out and we had a lovely conversation. And then right at the end, you know, they always ask for questions. And four people came to ask questions, and each of them were Hong Kongers, like New Zealand Hong Kongers, of their, and they spoke about their own experiences. And it was really beautiful. And then right at the end, just as everyone was clapping and saying goodbye, someone shouted out, Hong Kong and Gaia, which is go Hong Kongers. And it was just such a beautiful experience. Um, I really loved the idea that you know, my book is able to sort of start these conversations or keep them going, which I think is so important now. You've just kind of um, explained your positionality and kind of how how you think of this. Um, I have a uh, another observation, Louisa, and I don't think I have said this to you. And this obviously reflects my own biases and 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 kind of where I look at life. Um, you have writers in Australia don't always get published overseas. Um, female writers in Australia um, get published overseas um, uh, less often than male writers uh, and normally for fiction not for non-fiction and definitely not for anything that dares go near the grand movements of history and geopolitics um, and I am in awe that um, you have gone all the way there <laughs> it is very rare for a writer in Australia and I think it is a really beautiful thing I would like to ask how you are. Um, and I mean, in the sense that you, you know, you protect your sources, you're a journalist, um, you have seen a lot of things. And I know that it is, that communication with Hong Kong is not great um, because it can't be at the moment. Um, how do you navigate that? It is, it is quite hard because, you know, when I wrote, the book I knew that it would stop me from going back to Hong Kong and I already knew that but then when the national security legislation was published it was perfectly clear that I would not be returning to Hong Kong um, so that was a tricky thing to navigate but I think as a writer I also needed to give myself the freedom to write the book that I wanted to write um, and in order to do that, I needed not to kind of be bound by this idea, oh, you know, if I don't say this, maybe I'll, it'll be okay, I'll be able to go back, you know, I just had to have that clean slate. So I knew that that would be a consequence of writing the book so that I, I guess it kind of heightened the process. Um, since then, it has become a lot harder to think and write about Hong Kong, um, you know, I, um, it, and, you know, I hear from friends in Hong Kong how much things have changed and I find it quite terrifying. You know, one friend even said to me, oh, I wanted to like your Facebook post, but I, I was scared and I didn't know whether I should. And I was just thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what a small thing, a click, just a click, but there's so much anxiety about, you know, digital surveillance and online surveillance and what you can say and what you can't say um and i you know of course this is terrible for people who live there but it's also problematic for people outside hong kong because i think it's so much harder to report on what's happening in hong kong you know there's this is huge trial at the moment of uh, 47 activists who tried to do a primary poll um ahead of an election and they really, um, th that's uh, their, their standing trial for subversion. Um, and, you know, it means that people are really not willing to talk 
um, because it can be dangerous. And so the pool of people that the media can talk to in and about Hong Kong is shrinking very, very rapidly. And I think, you know, for someone like me, then I want to write more about Hong Kong, but I'm not there. I'm perfectly aware that not being there hampers my ability to express what it feels like to be there, but people who are there are unable to, to talk about it. So you're in this kind of bind where uh, effectively there's very few people, almost no one can talk with authority about what about Hong Kong because those people, the, um, and so, you know, it, it's a very tricky situation. I do occasionally still write about Hong Kong, but less and less because, you know, it's longer and longer since I've been there. The last time I was there was 2020. And although, you know, I have many friends uh, and people who are there, it's just not the same as being there. Changing tack a little bit, Louisa, um, because I do think that this is remarkable. Can you talk to us about the path to publication? It is an unexpectedly complex book, both in terms of the the ideas in it, but also in the way that it has been written. Um, how did you get it out there, uh, and not just in Australia, but around the world? So I um, I published first in the US, actually. My publisher there is uh, Riverhead Books, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House. And I have um, an extraordinary editor there, Becky Salatan, who was really important in um, the way, <laughs> ended up being very important in the way that I wrote this book, because she was the one who kept pushing me to write this sort of more, more personal book. Um, so uh, I actually sold the book first uh, in the US and then it uh, text bought the Australia and New Zealand rights. Um, I think, you know, you talk about how hard it is for Australian women to write nonfiction books that are published overseas. I think I was helped by the fact that um, I, I was a journalist in in the US and NPR is pretty, um, it's, it's quite well known. So I already had somewhat of a public profile in the US um, and my first book was published in the US. But I also, I guess I wouldn't ever want to uh, think, oh, I can't write a book about this because <laughs> I'm a woman. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I, I might not get published. You know, I wouldn't want to have those kind of limitations. I would like to think that the publishing industry will, um, you know, look at books on their merits. And I, you know, I'm hoping that there's <laughs> a shift also in who gets published and why, because I think, you know, if women authors are not being published, then that's a, gi a gigantic loss. And I think, you know, the way women write nonfiction and write history, um, you know, it, it, it's also necessary or more than necessary, it's required. Absolutely. Part of this book was associated with uh, your PhD. Um, the idea of a PhD uh, and then, you know, um, a work of nonfiction that has a much, much broader audience than a PhD, in my mind, they kind of conflict um, and, can you kind of talk through the, the, the tension there between kind of, you know, what you need to do uh, and the rigor that needs to be applied within the academic context to then something that people actually want to read? And Louisa, people do want to read <laughs> and are still reading in total pity. Um, I think there is, a, there is a tension there. And I guess that tension was also one of the things that was behind the way that I wrote the book. Because a long time ago, when I started writing the book, so my mother's like a, a writer as well and has written a number of books about Hong Kong. And she gave me her library of, her, uh, of books about Hong Kong to read. And before I started writing or at the beginning, she said, oh, next time you go to Hong Kong, you must go and talk to uh, my friend, this 
historian. Um, and so I met him and he uh, had been an academic in the university and he complained a lot about it. And he said, oh, you know, a book, a proper book of Hong Kong history will never be written because academia doesn't like that kind of thing. Academia doesn't like these, <laughs> you know, large surveys. It only wants very narrow, very deep studies. And in order to fulfill the needs of academia, academics can't write the kind of thing that's required for Hong Kong. And he said, oh no, it will never happen. And he'd actually left academia because he'd been so sort of annoyed by this and then it, you know you also have the tension between writing about Hong Kong where so many of the prime resources are in English but they're very colonial and historical and then the Chinese thinkers and writers are thinking and writing a lot of their work is not even in English it's not cited or used in any way um, and so I kind of wanted to try and bridge that. I wanted to try and write um, a book that did some of the things that he thought was missing. Um, and I think I was lucky that I had supervisors for my PhD who knew what I wanted to do and they supported me and they sort of helped me get there. So. In the end, although it was very, very, very painful, as I'm sure you know, <laughs> any PhD is, uh, the writing of the PhD, it did really help the writing of the book. Uh, it was very different from the book. The actual PhD, you know, it has an exegesis, it has textual analysis of newspaper coverage of the King of Kowloon. And, you know, it's very granular looking at sort of word usage and Chinese language newspapers and royal metaphors and things like that. Um, but, it, you know, when I wrote, when I was doing the PhD the whole way through, I kept thinking, oh my God, I, you know, this is such, a, it's so granular. I, I didn't really enjoy it that much, but later on I saw that it had really laid so much of the groundwork for me in a way that I hadn't realized when I was sort of in the trenches trudging through them. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, nobody enjoys a PhD. Um, <laughs> we um, we have mentioned and you have spoken um, about some of the King of Kowloon's story today, but I feel like, um, can you, can you um, uh, share with the audience, um, you know, the end of his story and um, uh, as it is and, you know, what artworks um, and what signs of his are left? Mm. So he, um, so he, Nobody really knows when he began painting, but it was probably in um, the 60s or the 70s. So he was painting around Hong Kong for 50 years. Um, in 1997, he had his first exhibition and um, he died in 2007. Um, and before he died, he was in a nursing home for a few years. So he wrote on paper. So there's quite a few works of his on paper that are around or in museums and galleries around the world, but there were very few works um, in public space in Hong Kong. And I went to try and look for all of them as I was writing the book. And there's, a, the, I could find a handful, sort of six or seven. Um, in 2017, one of them, which was uh, um, uh, on an a, electricity box, it was painted over by a government contractor because um, he didn't realize that it was, you know, to him, it was just scrawl. It was just ugly scrawl and he painted over it. He didn't realize that it was uh, significant because the government has never, um, while it has protected a couple of them, it hadn't really protected all of them or done anything to sort of signpost that this was not random graffiti, but King of Kowloon graffiti. Um, but, as I was writing my book, I, I met this very extraordinary uh, figure, a man called Joel Chung. Um, he's now changed his name to Willie Chung since the book came out. And he was 
um, a great friend of the King of Kowloon's throughout the last years of his life. He visited him in the nursing home and bought him paper and pens to write with. And he put on art exhibitions of his after his death. And as I did the reporting, as I went to interview him, it then turned out that Willie Chung had done this ex extraordinary project where he had noted on a spreadsheet some of the locations where the King of Kowloon had had painted stuff and um, he had protected, he had, when these works had been painted over, he had chipped away the paint on top and then gone back and covered them over with a special kind of clear varnish and then covered them up again. So it was like a secret museum of invisible King of Kowloon works that exists around Hong Kong, but Willie Chung is the only person who knows where they are. Um, but in recent years, a few more of them have emerged. Um, some of them, he, I think, pulled off the bits of the uh, outer uh, covering, and some of them just through wear and tear and time have emerged. And one of them, which was under a railway bridge, just kind of came into view last year. Someone, maybe Willie, I don't know who it was, chipped away at the paint. And so people woke up one morning and there was this King of Kowloon, you know, big wall painting that had just emerged under a railway bridge, just like that overnight. And um, it became a thing, you know, people went there to take pictures, uh, people posed, people did TikToks or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I I was really moved by that because even when I was writing the book, I had moments of thinking, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only person who, you know, me and the other weirdos who <laughs> are obsessed by the King of Kowloon. There's a very small group of us <laughs> devotees. But then when this happened and I saw people, you know, going there on this sort of pilgrimage to take pictures of the sign, but no, it's not just me. It's uh, it wasn't imagining it. Um, so, in my book, I you know I was worried about how he, you know, I think what he writes, the King of Kowloon's calligraphy does speak to Hong Kongers. It speaks to Hong Kongers on multiple levels. One of the reasons is because he was writing about th these issues, dispossession and sovereignty, and loss. Um, long before other people were. He was writing about dispossession and land so long ago that, you know, when Hong Kong was a British colony, people thought he was completely crazy. But of course, these were the very things that were at the heart of that 2019 movement. And then, you know, I, I think as I wrote the book, the other thing that I thought about was that he was also writing about loss. Because the what he did was very un-Chinese, you know, when you've lost something, it's humiliating to come out in public and to talk about the pain and the loss and the injustice, you know, that, and yet his way of dealing with loss was to trumpet it, to tell the world. And I think that also speaks to Hong Kongers now because Hong Kongers have lost their city. And so, you know, in a way, this is another, you know, in a way he's ahead <laughs> of the time. And, you know, people who were, were in that sort of select club that I spoke about, you know, when I went to interview them, they'd say, you know, we thought he was crazy, but now we think he was a shaman. He predicted the future, you know. He, and I, I do think that, you know, it is one prototype for dealing about loss is to talk about it publicly and to write about it. So I guess that's what I've done too. <laughs> I think you have, Louisa. I would like to ask you what you're going to do next. And I don't mean that as a throwaway comment. I, I mean, you know, this this is a remarkable work and, you know, it, it has come with consequences for you um, in terms of return to Hong Kong. How do you, as a person, as a writer, as a journalist, like, where do you want to go next and maybe kind of look after yourself as you take on the next work? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it, yes, it, 
I have to say, I, I have a track record of writing books that make it hard for me to <laughs> write more books. So after my first book, I could it, it was hard for me to go back to China. Now it's hard for me to go back to Hong Kong. Uh, so my children have begged me not to write about Australia. <laughs> Um, but I am I'm working on a book which is uh, about history and family history and women. Um, it, it's part memoir. Um, it's at a very early stage. It's a kind of big and complicated. <laughs> It'll probably take a long time. I I work quite slowly. It took me almost ten years to write this book. Um, so I'm only at the beginning at the moment. Louisa, I want to congratulate you again. I know I have done this before, but I um, I find this work, um, for those who have listened to Louisa today, this is a, a work that should be on your bookshelf um, and maybe one to return to as, uh, you know, as a way of people, how we consider living through history and what we do about it. Um, you have taught me a lot, Louisa. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Astrid. Um, uh, I hope everybody has enjoyed um, watching uh, and listening to Louisa today. Thank you so much. Um, and also thank you to the Melbourne City of Literature for hosting Between the Lines.